So, dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to our monthly EAL webinar. Welcome tonight. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Gideon Richter, and show a short uh, video. What does it take to make a medicine? You need to shift your perspective to see success comes from a series of innovations. Without the dedicated work of our highly trained researchers, no such progress would be possible. It is today that experts need to think about the diseases of tomorrow, and premium quality requires the latest technology. All these aspects come together to create new treatments that will improve the health of millions. This is what we work for every day. Gideon Richter, health is our mission. So thank you, Gideon Richter. Dear all, be aware that the webinar is being recorded. So if you miss your webinar, you will have the opportunity to catch it up. Today, we are gonna to speak about MRI staging in patients with deep infiltrating endometriosis and hashtag enzyme classification. And for this reason, it's a big pleasure to have today, Professor Jörg Keckstein from Austria the inventor and editor of uh, enzyme classification, worldwide well-known endometriosis surgeon, author of many uh, books and publications related to endoscopic surgery and uh, endometriosis surgery, inspiration for a young surgeon like me, uh, founding member of uh, International Neuropology Soci Society of Neuropology, Actually, we can speak a lot about him, but I will keep it short. Professor Jörg Eckstein, thank you for being here, and the word is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I will make it, keep it short. Great pleasure to have Isabel Thomasin uh, in, now today, this evening, and to listen to her and to find and to get her ideas. Isabel is a very well-known radiologist and she's working in Paris and uh, at the Sorbonne and is chief of two departments. And she's also the president of the National Society of Women's Imaging and uh, in France. And she is also author of many publications and um, she's also doing some other work beside endometriosis, but endometriosis seems to be also one of her main topic and for that she invented a new classification for the imaging the dpe I, I, e, uh, ei and she <clears throat> uh, did many publication on that and we are very interested since mri is the imaging in france and we do not have it in the german speaking countries at the same manner and for that, we are very keen and very interested to hear what she's talking about, the imaging, how to describe the disease, and um, what is new, and how should we classify or should we not classify it. And she's now also co-author of this paper, which comes out very soon, of eight different uh, international societies, a consensus paper on imaging. And uh, Isabel is part of this paper and I'm happy about this. Isabel, now I <laughs> will stop and I'm very happy to have you here in our group. And please, the, um, the screen is for you. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. So, um, we, we, I will try during this uh, lecture to show you the uh, different uh, topic on MR, MR staging and classification and new classification um, of endometriosis. So we know that several classifications were developed in the field of endometriosis, um, but for different objectives, some classification uh, try just to do an exhaustive description, some classification uh, like EFI is for fertility issues, others for surgical complexity of for predicting the risk of postoperative complication. But there's also different classification uh, according to different uh, techniques, imaging techniques. There's some classification for ultrasonography, other classification for MRI, and also some classification were developed by the surgery. And you will see that it's not always very easy 
to apply some classification depending on the different techniques. So the objective of this lecture will to present the value of MRI for endometriosis staging and how to use in clinical practice to play a role in the surgical management of patients. So the background, finally, we will develop three main parts. We'll see that um, very two short parts, the superficial endometriosis and adnexal endometriosis. And I will focus this lecture on the deep pelvic endometriosis and with the different locations, the central, the lateral, and very shortly, extra pelvic, deep pelvic endometriosis. For, for superficial location, we know that MRI is not the best. Clearly, we are not so good. There's a low detection rate with MRI, but also with ultrasonography. But we know that this location can be the reason of pain and infertility. And that is the reason why sometimes when the medical treatment is completely uh, inefficient and the imaging techniques are completely negative, uh, the surgeon could do could propose a laparoscopy uh, because there's no other solution for the patient. Regarding adnexal location, we know that ultrasonography and MRI have exactly the same uh, accuracy, the same sensitivity and specificity. And we will have to describe all the elements that will uh, be necessary to know when the patient uh, is essentially is uh, suffer from infertility, like the size of endometrioma, if they're unique or multiple, if it's unique or bilateral, if there's a residual normal ovarian parenchyma, and, and the, if the, the control lateral ovary is normal or not with a number of follicles. It's also important to describe if there is associated tubal endometriosis and also associated hydrosalpunks, but it's not a specific criteria for MRI. That's true that sometimes using the trust murphy, you can have atypical uh, features for um, endometrioma or for uh, hematosalpunks, uh, endometriotic hematosalpunks. And when you have this type of cyst, uh, if you look at that, uh, is it only some clot or is it papillary vegetation? Using ultrasonography, it's not so easy. And we know that 2% of endometriosis uh, can become a malignancy. And so sometimes it's useful to complete by MRI ultrasonography to characterize this lesion. And the protocol will be completely different if the, the question is, is uh, the problem of potentially a suspicion of malignancy and, and this cyst. And we will do an MRI with gadolinium injection to do the characterization as for any adnexal mass. And we know that MRI uh, has an added value after a complex or indeterminate lesion discover ultrasonography. If we focus our attention on the deep pelvic endometriosis, uh, from, you can see the, the value of ultrasonography and MRI from this review on the Cochrane published years ago. And I think it's completely correspond with our uh, feeling in, in clinical routine. We know that ultrasonography may, will make a lot of good diagnosis, especially on central location and with a very good specificity, but it could be difficult to detect lesions that are far from the probe. And this is the reason why the sensitivity of MRI for deep pelvic endometriosis location is better. You can see here the sensitivity is higher than ultrasonography. But the problem of the MRI is in contrast, we discuss, we describe a lot of things and sometimes the MRI lack of specificity. And I will try to show you finally uh, the advantage and, and the, the utility to, to combinate ultrasonography and MRI. So what we, why we need uh, to have an optimal staging of deep pelvic endometriosis uh, before surgery. Um, for, firstly, it's important to well understand that there's no visualization of the, the extension by laparoscopy in case of severe disease. The second problem is the risk of postoperative complication could be different according to the different location and, and the presence of the association of multiple location. And in this uh, setting, the presence of lateral location is a critical issue, and it's very, very important to inform the patient of the risk of postoperative complication because the surgery is a very com could be a very complex surgery, uh, as complex as urban cancer. But the disease is a benign disease, 
and it's very important to implicate the patient in the decision to operate. The other point is that the surgery may implicate different surgical subspecialties like gynecologists, but also digestive surgeon and urologist. And we have to plan uh, the, the, the surgery with all these uh, uh, subspecialities. And as the most sensitive technique, uh, an MRI is necessary to have a good planning of the surgery. So if we look at all these criteria, the detection of DPE, the detection of lateral location, the criteria to, to discuss with the patient, which are operating time, hospitalization stay, hospital stay, uh, the post-operative complication. And if we look at the, 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 the literature, we have different classifications that were published. First the, first, the classification that everybody knows is the ASRM classification, uh, which is the first classification to have described uh, and to, which is probably the most diffuse classification. But the main problem of this classification is uh, there's no description of lateral location. There's no co correlation final with, with the surgical um, pro, um, uh, criteria. Uh, and there's also in MRI uh, no no evaluation of the reproducibility. And recent another recent classification were published in our center. Uh, it's under stage classification, which uh, is just only one publication in a monocentric uh, population, no external validation and no evaluation of the reproducibility. The ANZIA classification is probably the, um, the classification which is a, a very um, a lot of study in the in the literature. It's a classification that describes DPE uh, location um, with a new uh, hashtag and MR ANZIA classification. There's also an assessment of lateral location. Um, some publication try to correlate uh, MR ANZIA classification with uh, with the different uh, criteria for surgery and good correlation for the A and the C compartment for operating time, hospital stay, and post-operative complication. There's some external validation, but in our experience, but also experience of other team, uh, we have a difficulty for reproducibility, especially for describing the B compartment uh, that is related to uh, uterosacral location, which stay the most frequent location of deep pelvic endometriosis. And uh, finally, it was not completely adapted because we have a lot of description of future circle ligament in our practice. And so we need to have a, a, a classification which is repro reproducible, whatever, um, finally, whatever the score given to the, to the surgeon. And so we, in, in this setting, we developed this DPEI classification, uh, firstly, in a monocentric study. And we recently uh, performed an external validation. And I will show you how this classification work and what the main results are. So this classification was uh, was created on the PCI model, which uh, was which is dedicated for peritoneal carcinomatosis, and we um, try to finally distinguish the local uh, the central location, uh, which are del delineated by the pelvic vis visceral the, the visceral fascia here. And we have the anterocentral, mediocentral, and posterocentral uh, central location. And in the same way, we will describe uh, some lateral location, anterolateral, mediolateral, and posterolateral location. So finally, in the pelvic, we have nine compartments. You have the description of the different organ, the different location in the different compartments. So the mediocentral compartment corresponds to uterus, cervix, uh, and, and also um, rectovaginal septum. The anterocentral is all location around the, the bladder and also the proximal round ligament. The posterocentral corresponds to um, rectum and, and rectosigmoid junction. And here on the lateral location, you have the distal round ligament on the anterolateral compartment, the parametrium, the ureter, and also over the parietal fascia, the pelvic wall. And then posterolateral compartment, you have the distal uterosacral ligament and uh, the uh, sacrorectal septum in both sides. In addition to these nine compartments, you have an extra pelvic look, uh, compartment. And we know that in, we can de detect that on, on pelvic MRI, but sometimes you have to do 
another type of MRI to describe this uh, location. In this category, you will find the seco and apendicular location, the sigmoid, sigmoid uh, location, the abdominal wall location, inguinal region, and the ureter at the level of the common iliac artery. So how we, we give the, how we calculate the score in this DPEI classification, we give one point if uh, anything in the compartment is, uh, is uh, uh, there's a location of endometriosis, even if there's two or three location, it's only one point. And there's some additional point uh, which are given if there is a location of the vaginal pouch on the bladder basis, on the ureter, or on the pelvic wall. So we describe three types of, uh, um, of severity. The low extensive when the score is lower or equal to two. The moderate extensive is the score is three or four. And the highly extensive is the score is more or equal to, to five. When we try and we recreate this classification, it was the first publication in Human Report in 2020 on 150 patients in a monocentric uh, study in, in Turnon Hospital. Uh, the reproducibility, reproducibility was uh, good, uh, 0.7, and uh, there was a correlation on the severity and the presence of lateral location and a very good correlation to predict operating time with significant difference between the three groups, but also hospital stay, where you can see that the duration is um, clearly significantly lower uh, uh, when it has a low extensive disease than a, a moderate extensive disease, and also significant difference between the moderate extensive disease and high extensive disease. And there was also the ability to predict the, the presence of uh, uh, complication uh, with different level of uh, complication, depending on the severity on the DPI uh, score uh, performed preoperatively. So based on that, we would like to see uh, if this classification uh, was efficient in other centers and in a different centers with different expertise in endometriosis. And we, uh, we create this uh, um, French multicentric national study with Pascal Rousset. And this, uh, finally, this uh, cohort includes 605 patients. Uh, we, we excluded some patients because there was no criteria, like, uh, for example, when the, the delay between the MRI and the surgery was too large, or when the, the, there was some missing clinical or pathological uh, data. And uh, here you have the uh, number of patients in the different seven centers. The population, the, the mean age in the population was a 33-year-old woman, was most of them was uh, uh, nulliparous with a uh, uh, median operating time of uh, 129 uh, minutes. Hospital stay uh, was a median of 3.2 days. And you have the level of uh, the number of complications. Uh, and we distinguish the severe complication when we do the correlation with a not severe complication based on the Clavian Dando classification. You can see if you look at the frequency of the location as we, uh, um, we expect, uh, most of uh, locations were located on the medio central compartment. You can see that 90% uh, of locations were, uh, were, were present in medio central uh, compartments. There was 43% uh, uh, of women with posterior central um, uh, compartment with location in the in the in the in the rectum, and this is probably due to um, the, um, the, the 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 centers that participated in this study because there was a lot of expert center with a high number of uh, surgery of the digestive uh, the, the rectum. There was a thirty percent of uh, uh, location on the bladder on the or on the proximal round ligament. And also uh, around 13 or 14 uh, look, uh, percent of uh, patients with lateral location. So here you have the result of the in this study. So you can see that it's completely uh, similar to the uh, first publication, with clearly uh, different um, uh, uh, clearly different the, the ability of the score to predict operating time and hospital stay. And this corresponds to the category we published in the first paper in Human Reprod. But what we discovered that was really nice 
is that even if you uh, took the number of the score, not the category, you have also a very linear correlation uh, between the score and operating time or hospital stay. We uh, demonstrate also that uh, the score was completely able to predict post-operative complication with very different percentage because the, you can see when, when you have a, a low extensive disease, the percentage is 3%, 3.3%, but when it's a severe disease, it's 10%. And for the patient, it's, I think it's, it's important to, this, to, to explain that um, preoperatively. Uh, as well as predicting de, de novo Voindy dysfunction with different results depending on the severity of the, 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 the disease on the DPI score. Also very important, we tested the reproducibility and we test not only the category, but the, the number of the score. And so that's the reason why we use a Blond and Altman analysis. And you can see that there is a very good reproducibility because there was a very low and uh, um, difference between the junior and the senior reader um, on the mean, but also on the standard deviation. What we discover also is that it, it was really important to describe in, in, the, in, the, in addition to the score, the type of compartments that were where the, the endometriosis was described, because depending on the type of compartments, there was no the same impact on operating time, hospital stay, and postoperative complication. So here an example of a 40-year-old woman with dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia. There was no personal history of pelvic surgery, uh, and there was a context of infertility. I, you have that the axial T2, the axial T1, and the axial T1 after fat suppression. So what we have, we go from up to down, is that there is a an endometrioma on the right and on the left side, a big endometriosis here with a, um, a endo external adenomyosis. And you, you recognize so the typical signal of uh, the cyst of the endometrioma. Uh, here you have the, the other view on Tagital. So it was a big um, extension on the sigmoid, uh, about four centimeters. There was some endometrioma with the kissing ovaries because there was, parent, there was a bilateral parameter uh, location. There was also external adenomyosis. And uh, here you can see um, the, some implants that uh, um, make easier uh, the, the detection to detect for the, for the radiologist. So here the, 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 the standardized uh, report we developed following this study um, with a description of the adnexal location, the description of the different criteria uh, that are important for the surgeon to, to, to describe in the report. Uh, and here, um, the uh, standardized report we developed with the Société d'Imagerie de la Femme, which is the National Society of Women's Imaging, with a description by compartments, uh, medio central, uh, posterior central, and through central, and also uh, extra pelvic compartments. And uh, we, um, we, we advise the, the radiologist to give also some drawing like that because it's uh, make easier the, the explanation for the patient uh, of the extension of the disease. So if we apply the DPE I score in this patient, uh, we have uh, five compartments with some disease, uh, as there was uh, also um, some, um, uh, in, in this patient, there was a vaginal pouch uh, location. We add uh, one point, uh, so it's a, a, a severe disease. And here you have the surgery. Finally, operating time in this patient was 290 minutes, hospital stayed five days, there was no post-operative complication, but this, uh, this numbers are completely in line with uh, the results of the multicentric um, uh, study. So uh, to, to develop this uh, multicentric study, uh, we work a lot with Pascal Rousset to develop uh, a lexicon because it was really important that the radiologist describe the lesion in the same way and we publish this lexicon and we show you uh, the content in the next slide uh, and based on this lexicon we uh, meet the uh, abdominal society of radiology in united states 
and uh, there is actually um, uh, working on the, an international consensus for standardization, the standardization of uh, uh, MR lexicon for endometriosis staging, which will be based on this compartmental an analysis. And uh, we work um, a lot with all these women, because there's a lot of women in this group, uh, to have something which, is, uh, uh, which could improve uh, the level of uh, MR report uh, to correctly describe endometriosis. So if you look at the content of this uh, lexicon, and uh, if we describe each location, the, the first location and the most frequent location are regarding central location. And that shows that when we begin to, to work on that, uh, we, we have a, a very low reproducibility and a, a real difficulty uh, for to be uh, to agree on the presence of location on, on torus and proximal luteosacral ligament. And uh, we, um, we, we apply uh, this criteria in the DPI score to, to, to positive uh, pr uh, proximal sacral ligament. So the diagnostic was positive uh, with or without hemorrhagic implants if there was a regular or irregular fibrotic thickening more than five millimeter, if there was a nodular um, uh, uh, sacral ligament, that means there was a nodule present in two different planes, if there was a retraction, if there was some speculation uh, that was defined by irregularity present in two different planes, that could be also a distortion of the shape and the or surrounding fat infiltration. And there was a, a sure positive diagnosis if the radiologist was able to detect hemorrhagic implants. So you can understand with this criteria that the MR protocol need to have at least two different planes on T2 and on T1, and this is really the minimal MR protocol. That means two different planes on T2 and two different planes on T1, and you need to have a T1 with fat suppression to be able to recognize endometriotic contents. Sometimes we have irregularity only on one plane or nodularity only on one plan, and in that case, uh, you cannot be sure. It's an uncertain diagnosis. And we know that we need to have the correlation with other technique to be sure um, there is a location on that. And when we uh, try to optimize the, the, the diagnostic accuracy of uh, imaging technique, especially for the different location of deep pelvic endometriosis, we perform a study we published uh, at the beginning of this year in Fertile Sterile. And we proved that finally there's only one solution. It's not the clinical examination alone. It's not the ultrasonography alone or MRI alone, which is uh, really good for uterosacral ligaments. But in our um, experience publishing this paper, finally the best uh, modality to have the better sensitiv sensitivity for good specificity was the combination between clinical examination, ultrasonography, and MRI. And if two on three technique was good, the positive, the, 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 the location was uh, positive. Uh, and applying this model, that means two modality positive on three, uh, you, you reach uh, a very good accuracy for uh, the diagnosis of uterosacral ligament. And in our practice, that's true when you discover this type of uh, isolated thickening of the uterosacral ligament, which is quite smooth. Uh, it could be useful to do a second look ultrasonography and or better a fuse MR ultrasonography to be sure to be on the right place. And you look for the, this uterosacral ligament on the ultrasonography and if there's nothing, there's no clinical examination, well, there's nothing at clinical examination, you have only MRI, you don't positive your uterosacral ligament. In that case, there was nothing at ultrasonography, nothing at clinical examination, and this was a false positive. So the second location in the major central compartment is location in the vaginal pouch or and rectovaginal septa under the Douglas pouch. And the criteria is the thickening of the of the vaginal pouch more than three millimeters. It's the same criteria on ultrasonography uh, as well as on MRI. Uh, if you are lucky, on MRI you will have some implants, and in that case, uh, it's completely uh, it's very very specific. But unfortunately, you will have uh, implants only in thirty percent of case, so it's not enough. And when it's really difficult, you can also be helped by its vaginal opacification. We can do a second um, in a second time uh, when you realize MRI. 
uh, when you have a depth on the presence of the vagina vaginal location. Here you have an example of uh, uh, the correlation, exactly the same view. You have here um, location on the vagin vaginal pouch. That patient was also a little uterusucral ligament. You can see easily on ultrasonography. More difficult, it was more difficult to MRI. And you have the advantage of uh, the fusion here uh, with the, the fusion with a T1 uh, weighted sequence. Uh, you end, here you have a little implant. Uh, and the T2 weighted sequence. And that's true when you begin um, ultrasonography for the uh, resident, for example, uh, the fusion uh, could be really helpful to improve um, more quickly the level on the ultrasonography to detect deep pelvic endometriosis. If we look at the result of the same study on the vagina, in that case also, uh, the, the better model to have a quite good sensitivity and specificity was a combination between clinical examination and MRI, because finally the, the, better tech, the best, the most sensitive technique for vaginal stay is a clinical examination. Um, but the, the combination of both increased the specificity. And there was a model, two, two modality on three positives that was the best uh, to diagnose vaginal location. In this major central compartment, you can you will rate also the external adenomyosis, um, which is uh, uh, it's not it's uh, it's not an adenomyosis; it's just a deep pelvic uh, location on the myometrium, uh, and uh, uh, you will describe that in this compartment, whatever the location of the external adenomyosis and the posterior or on the anterior part, your example here on the uh, posterior part, but also on the anterior part. If we go uh, posteriorly, we will have the location in the posterior central compartment and especially in the uh, erect, rectal um, and rectosigmoid location. Um, the, the definition is a disappearance of fatty tissue uh, lying between the uterus and the rectum and sigmoid colon, which is replaced by uh, tissue mass, uh, which form an obtuse angle with a wall of rectosigmoid. You have here uh, on T2, on T2 signal, on, on, on T2 sequence and MRI, on ultrasonography, on T1 uh, weighted sequence and MRI, and the correspondence with the surgery. And uh, we know we have several things to describe if the surgery for, for, for uh, plan the surgery uh, and to decide if uh, the surgeon can do uh, shaving, can opt for a discoid or a colorectal uh, segmentation and radical surgery. So we'll, we'll describe the localization, the extension length, the thickness, the circumference, and the distance between endometric location and anal margin. And uh, in this beautiful paper, Pascal Rousset demonstrates the ability of MRI to um, predict the possibility to do only a shaving or to uh, do a segmental resection. And the, to, to answer to all these questions, I think also in that case, you will need to combine the result from ultrasonography and MRI because depending on the question you will have to answer, sometimes MRI will be better, for example, for the location, for the, the distance uh, with the anal margin, the multifocality or the association with other things. But for the description, what happened, and, and finally, uh, the, the, the degree of uh, extension on the wall, the, the spatial resolution of ultrasonography is better. And for extension length, thickness, and circumference, uh, ultrasonography do better than MRI. So also in that case, very important to do both techniques together. If you go, go anteriorly, you will find the anterior central compartment and uh, uh, will have to describe uh, different things, especially uh, the location uh, of the, the, the endometriotic nodule regarding to the uh, ureteral mea. And that's the reason why we uh, distinguish three types of location in the bladder, the, the location of the dorm, which uh, means in the two, uh, anterior part of the, the basis, on the um, Vesico, uh, on the uh, vesicouterine uh, um, portion and on the basis. And that shows in the DPE score, when the location is on the basis of the bladder, you will add a point because we know uh, the complexity of the surgery is uh, clearly uh, more important if the location is on the basis than on the dome of the bladder. 
Regarding lateral location, um, that means we are over the visceral fascia. And uh, we know for th that location that MRI are, is clearly better than ultrasonography. Uh, we have three types of uh, location, the distal uterosacral ligament, that means the two external parts of the ligament, which, which correspond to the roof of the sacrorectal septum. The sacrorectal sep septum, uh, which is uh, the part of the uh, uh, the lateral location that are under the ureter, the horizontal par part of the ureter, and the parametrium with a radiologic definition of the parametrium, uh, which uh, which is uh, usually um, uh, above the ureter and which is anteriorly anterior in comparison with sacrorectal septum. That means. Uh, the parametrial location uh, are located in the mediolateral compartment, while uh, sacrorectal septum uh, are located in the posterior lateral compartment. And uh, we, uh, this, the, we, uh, when we perform this lexicon and do a consensus with the radiologist, uh, we we um, act that if the location was was anterior to the line which is adjacent to the anterior part of the anterior wall of the rectum. Uh, it was a, a parametrial location, and if the, if the location was posterior to this line, uh, that was a, a sacrorectal uh, septum location. Uh, here you have an example of a distal retrocircular ligament. Here an example of sacrorectal septum, and uh, it's um, well, the radiologist can help the surgeon describing uh, where the location go and if the location um, uh, go very um, deeply. Uh, in the pelvis, and also here an example of parametrial location in this patient that was interesting because you have the different location uh, and, and the different uh, slice. Here you have a parametrial location. Here you have the distal uterosacral ligament, which is different than the, uh, the location in the mesorectum. Here you have the normal um, sacrorectal section, which corresponds to the posterior part of the visceral fascia. Uh, here is the proximal retrocircular ligament. This corresponds to the posterior lateral location. And here is the mesorectum, which corresponds to the fascia recti. So here, to see that even if you are an expert, you are an expert in ultrasonography, uh, it's, it's very difficult to detect lateral locations in this patient uh, who had a very uh, severe endometriosis with uh, a location detected on the uterosacral ligament, but also on the rectus sigmoid um, wall. Uh, there was a, uh, we don't know, we didn't know if there was a vaginal location, but the sonovaginography show big nodules also on the vagina. There was no lateral location described as ultrasonography, but when we see what happened on MRI, you can see there's a big lateral uh, location on the parametrium and also on the left uh, sacrorectal septum. And uh, that's true with MRI, it's very clear to de describe this location on the uh, sacrorectal septum here and on the parametrium here. And that was really difficult uh, with the trustography to describe these lateral locations. Uh, last lateral location we can we have to describe also are the location on the ant anterior lateral compartment with the uh, wrong ligament and uh, with, with which is described when there is a, a fibrotic thickening generally more than one centimeters compared to the contralateral wrong ligament which could be regular or irregular margin and could have sometimes uh, nodular appearance, and here you have a correlation between the, the, the MRI and the surgery. Finally, the last location we have to describe are the location over the parietal fascia, and that means the location of the true pelvic wall location. This location are rare, uh, fortunately for the patient, but it's associated with a very complex surgery with uh, pot potential injuries on the nerves and on the vessels. And that's the reason why it's very important to report that location uh, before the surgery to inform the patient of the risk of complication. So e here you have some example. It's also important to have uh, uh, in mind and the radiologist have in mind all the different pelvic nerve that may be involved uh, by pelvic endometriosis. And uh, uh, we have 
different neurological symptoms which, which are correlated on the different type of nerve uh, that can be involved. Uh, we know that if there's a surgery, if there is a chronic um, lesion of this nerve, uh, that, that can be permanently damaged due to inflammation, uh, fibrosis, and uh, adhesions. And uh, uh, we will have, I will not time to describe all these uh, potential injuries, but uh, we are able to detect all these uh, uh, nodules in all these different nerves uh, in the pelvis. Here's some example, an example of sacral nerves, an example of, of lumbosacral plexus with a big, big nodules, uh, which is uh, very, very important. Uh, notation on the septic notch, which is one of the most common site involvement. And, and here also a big, big location, uh, uh, which need to be um, very well known by the radiologist because if they don't put their eyes on this location, they, they could miss it. So it's very important uh, that the radiologists have to know this location and to describe it. So in conclusion, um, I hope you understand that an optimal staging is based on the combination of clinical examination, transvaginal ultrasonography, and MR imaging. Uh, also that MR imaging is able to detect locations that are um, hidden at the beginning of the laparoscopic surgery and that need a dedicated MR classification to correctly stage the severity of the disease. Uh, DPEI classification is now externally validated and very well correlated with operating time, hospital stay, and postoperative complication. And it's very important that radiologists use a standardized lexicon, uh, give a score with a type of compartment and involved by endometriosis to better guide the surgeon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Isabel, it was a, a very good overview and uh, convincing your work. And uh, I saw that uh, you were going on with uh, more detailed uh, uh, calculations, which is probably necessary to understand this. And uh, um, I enjoy your work. And um, because it's very similar to the ancient classification, it goes in details. It describes the disease how it is, and it doesn't try to reduce it to stage one, two, three, four. I mean, you do it with some points, but this is something which at the beginning should not be done. My question is, um, um, I have two questions. The, the, the combination of MRI and ultrasound, which you mentioned, means much more um, organization for patients uh, what should we prefer for the first step? Um, this is uh, for the daily work and on the different countries, the habits are different. So how is it in your department or in, let's say, in France? So I think it's very important to distinguish the diagnostic problematic. That means the first step is the woman have an endometriosis, yes or no? from the staging which the patient is referred before surgery to plan the surgery. And I think the answer will be different depending on the situation we are. If it's a diagnostic problematic, we, we can do uh, techniques differently, separately. And finally, uh, to see which, which technique is positive or negative. And okay, there's two techniques positive, only one technique positive, and I think it could be a way to assess the good diagnostic, the positive diagnosis. If we are in a staging position, I think we need to have stunter which are able to propose MRI and ultrasonography. Because, for example, when you have a staging of the sigmoid to do, it's, in, it's very useful to do it with a preparation. And for MRI imaging, we do a bowel preparation. If you redo your ultrasonography after a bowel preparation, clearly you will be better. So I think it, it, it's really um, a pity if you are not able to, be, to, to propose this boost technique together in the staging you know, uh, issue. In France, in my center, we do both. So it's easy, I know. But even if the, um, if you, I think we learn a lot to do ultrasography after MRI, but it's not the same question you will to answer. So um, it could be a gynecologist and a radiologist, doesn't matter. But I think it's important to do it in the same day 
if the question is the staging of the disease, because clearly with MRI, we are not so good than ultrasonography to evaluate the wall of the, of the rectum. The main problem for me is uh, the, um, um, how you find together the radiologist and in the daily work. I mean, uh, you mentioned in your uh, the paper of Enzelsberger, and uh, sorry, sorry, I have to. Sorry. So I have the main problem is um, the main problem is that um, the, um, the the findings you have the MRI the patient is in the radiology department and the the gynecologist who is operated in, in the gynecology department and for my opinion you have the advantage when you do the ultrasound you see the patient and you operate the patient as well then you have to, two imaging together. Uh, in the same time for the surgeon, it could be advantages because if the surgeon doesn't understand the imaging, he still is not so well informed in comparison to ultrasound. That, that's also why we do uh, MDT session dedicated for endometriosis. And during this MDT session, it's also a way to communicate with the surgeon to show them MR uh, images and to make, that understand, make them understand how to read the imaging during the surgery. Yes. So I think it's really very important because we in, the radiologists will improve their level if they work with the surgeon, and the surgeon will improve their level if they work with radiologists. So the ideal situation is really to work together because we need to have information from RI and information from ultrasonography. And there's a question in the chat you know, what is the most important, the sensitivity of specificity? It's a very difficult question because if you do a lot of false positive with your retrosacral ligament, it's not good. But if you miss some lateral location before surgery, it's not good. <laughs> so we yes. need to, it, there's no, there's no one, one weapon depending on the clinical situation. I saw for the screening and for the diagnostic part, it's important to have a good specificity because the risk is to perform surgery for nothing. And it's worse than doing nothing to do surgery for nothing. Uh, but, yes, but, that's, that's true. That's true. But uh, um, I mean, the main problem is um, also that um, with the uh, ultrasound, with the with the ultrasound um, image, imaging, you have the tenderness. You feel yeah. where the, where are the pain? Where is the pain which is not possible in MRI? How should and and the the dynamic uh, investigation? Yeah, 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 completely. And and that's the reason why we need to have both because with the probe of ultrasonography. We are not able to have a deep analysis and to see everything. So that's the reason why we, we don't have to, 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 to finally say, okay, this, we, this one is better than this one. I think we need both. And that's true that if we want to be the most accurate, the people need to work together. If the radiologist is able to do both, okay. But if the gynecologist do ultrasonography and the radiologist do MRI, they have to work together to, to, be, to, to, have, to have the best team, I think. Yes, so I want to uh, ask a question by Peter Wichmann that the recently published study on MRI in adolescent women was generously recommended for young women. Uh, the high rate of deep infiltrating endometriosis in this group was criticized. What is your opinion on this? In this paper from Anne Lodi, um, there was uh, there was there was that was uh, funny because in this uh, in this paper uh, with the age it was different frequency of, of endometriosis uh, and an increasing according to the age. My my feeling is um, it's complex because when the patient the patients are very young. Uh, the risk is to underdiagnose the disease or, or mainly to overdiagnose the disease. And, and given to the patient hormonal treatment during a long time uh, before 18 year, old, 18 year old, when we discuss with a pediatric um, um, uh, doctor, uh, and it's not so good. So, my feeling is we, we should um, not do a lot of MRI before 18 year old. I think it's 
It's difficult because there's a pressure of the, the patient, a pressure of the, the mother, <laughs> because you cannot do a transvaginal ultrasonography usually in this patient. And so you have not very good solution, but I think the, the first main point is to be sure you are not missing other things because the problem if you the patient go to do an MRI is only for endometriosis you will not diagnose the digestive pathology you can have and explain this uh, chronic pain pelvic pain so I think the first point is to have a good ultrasonography but for um, doing all the differential diagnosis and uh, I think we should not do a lot of MRI uh, b before 18 year olds I think okay. I think we, we do a lot of false positive another question was um how do you describe the learning curve for pelvic MRI for radiologic uh, trainees? This is the, a very good question because uh, we have sometimes patients come with the MRI pictures and the diagnosis was wrong. Yeah. And when you give it to the expert, suddenly the diagnosis is completely different. So the learning curve is quite short, but there's no a lot of radiologists that are really good for endometriosis. That's the main problem. There's a problem of education, probably because finally the first de description of deep pelvic endometriosis and MRI was 20 years ago. So I think I'm not sure every radiologist have learned that during their residency. Um, but when we compare the learning curve of MR and ultrasonography for endometriosis, clearly uh, the residents uh, are, are able to read an MRI at the end of the six months of, uh, of their period in our department, and they are not able to do a very complex, that means they are not able to detect all location with ultrasonography, they are able to detect bladder, no problem, sigmoid uh, rectal, no problem, but uterosacral ligament or vagina is more difficult to learn them. So it's not a problem for learning curve, it's a problem of the number of radiologists that are really um, uh, educated for this pathology, and I am. I hope that the standardization and the international working group will diffuse all the the, the features and the lexicon, and will help to improve the level of radiologists in in this pathology. Um, one uh, comment from my side is: Wouldn't it be good? I mean, if you use uh, DPEI or hashtag Ancian, if you if you ask the radiologist to give answers to all departments in the exactly. And this was also the idea of the ancient classification. The, the radiologist has to give an answer plus or minus. Yeah, yeah you're completely right. It's a way to, um, if the Everything. radiologist have to, 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 to click, okay, there is, this not, there, there is not, we yes. know that the, the level of the report increase. It's not enough, but it's a way to be sure that they will look at every, uh, location you have to check after I know uh, it's not so easy but it's I think it's really re important to ask uh, classification at the end of the report it's a way to improve the level clearly so we need a kind of um, recommendation by you and your colleagues what has to be fulfilled when you look for endometriosis what is the technical what is so, the technical a minimum uh, expectations and uh, the 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 expertise of the of the radi radi radiologist himself or herself. Yeah, yeah, it's a really important, and it's, that's the reason why also when we perform this retrospective multicentric study, we didn't want to have a very complex protocol because we want something which is a which we can apply everywhere. So in, in this study, we just need two sequence in T2s that mean sagittal and axial, and two, T, and, and two plan in T1 or 3D T1. And when we test, finally, if other sequence, there's a lot of other sequence, the gadolinium injection, the type of uh, coil that means 3, T, 3 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, or uh, 3D acquisition, et cetera, finally, that was not the point that changed the, the accuracy of the of the MRI. What we, the, re, the very important point to have a, a successful MRI is to ask a bowel preparation. That was really the point that uh, when we 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 are, we are performing a study on on the retrospective data from the okay. uh, the endovalley MRI, uh, endoval MRI. And finally, the main point is to have a good bowel preparation. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and then another question is, <clears throat> Elvin asked, thank you for the excellent presentation. I have two questions. Does each patient with endometriosis in your center get MRI diagnostic? And um, have you compared the DPI uh, classification with hashtag NCM? So um, all the patients refer for surgery have MRI imaging in my center, if they refer for surgery. If they are refer for diagnosis, they will have a clinical examination and ultrasonography, and they will be referred for MRI only if the medical treatment is not efficient, because finally it's a benign disease. We just want to decrease the symptom. Uh, uh, we compare a DP classification with the ASEAN classification, not the hashtag ASEAN classification. And you have the result of this comparison is the human report paper published in 2020. So that was the old version of the ASEAN. Yeah. But what we, we, our main problem in MRI is the measurement of the uterus record ligament because it's very difficult to be reproducible for when you measure the uterus sacral ligament in and the, the old ANZIAN classification, you will have to, to, to know if the, the thickness is less than one centimeter, one to three centimeters. And that is really difficult to have something reproducible between the readers. Uh, another question concerning this uh, comparison you showed in your <clears throat> um, combination of MRI and ultrasound analysis, that for the I look for the vaginal location compartment that ultrasound was better than MRI, um, and then the combination the result was lower. So the ultrasound was nine, 91, 4, 4, and the MRI was ninety uh, eighty four point three. Finally, the winner is probably the clinical examination for the vagina. <laughs> Yes, so and we the, can compare this, is, this is exactly this is what I'm asking you now. Yeah. <laughs> should not we should not uh, uh, insist on one technique? We should no. open and we should not forget the clinical uh, workup. And for that, the ultrasound is still one one main tool for us. Sure. But we need people. We need uh, experts like you, and this is our main problem. That at the moment. Uh, for example, in the German speaking countries, we do not have expert centers in MRI. They are not real visible at the moment. Um, uh, no, this is something no, no. which has to be improved. Yeah, clinical examination is really important. And I think it's important also to explain to the patient that clinical <laughs> examination is really important for endometriosis because we know that some fear from the patient to have clinical examination, but we know we finally. The, the sensitivity, the highest sensitivity for vaginal location was clinical examination. It was not MRI and not mm -hmm. ultrasonography because yes. it's 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 so it's it's not it's not necessary to do complicated when finally the simple things with clinical examination can be made. And I think it's also an important point. So if the difference you can see in my slide was not significantly different, so there was different, yes, but not was significantly not different. different. Yeah, exactly. Another question that was exactly. a question by Ahmed Kale. He asked for discoid shaving, segmental, which technique is useful, ultrasound or MRI or combination, these two techniques. I mean, you give the, you give or gave already these answers. Yeah, 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 because I can answer, but you know how they indicate discoid versus segmental or, or discoid versus shaving depend on the the, the the surgical team. So what we can give to the red, the surgeon is. Uh, the thickness of the of the wall, and that is important to decide shaving versus other technique. The extension length, and that is important because in our center, for example, what it's more than four centimeters, we'll decide to do a segmental resection. What is lower, it can propose a discoid depending on the size of, of the, 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 the instrument they use on yes. surgery. So there's no, you know, a specific point, but uh, there's no uh, specific cutoff. But we know the point the surgeon will need to decide, and some point I given better by the ultrasonography yes. and other BMI. So a very similar question was done by Oral Engin. He also asked for um, uh, the nerve lesion. What uh, what is the feature for the MRI? I mean, you showed it already. For my opinion, and for the ancient classification, which one is more diagnostic in uterus uh, or MRI ultrasound or MRI? I mean, this is. Um, um, at the moment, the ancient, you are 
familiar with the old ancient, but not probably with the with the hashtag ancient. Or I I think in in French they are in France they are also using the hashtag ancient now in Roman uh, Horace and um, Nicolas used it. Yeah, the surgeon uh, like it. Um, the, the radiologist, as they have to do this measurement of the ultrasonic ligaments, don't, don't like it. But <laughs> probably we work together to improve that in the future. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we are now, it's eight o'clock. We have to close our session. And I want to thank you, Isabel. It was great to see you, to listen to you, and to watch your presentation. And um, I thank also all of the participants who were listening and asking questions. And I thank also EEL uh, to give this opportunity to the super experts. And uh, we are looking forward. And uh, I'm sure we are not at the very end of this <laughs> um, trip uh, of imaging. And we are at the very beginning that everything changes because we will have less surgery. And if we do surgery, we know the lesion in advance without seeing the patient with ultrasound or with MRI. That This is something which is very, very uh, challenging. And I thank you and I thank all the participants and I now will close the session. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for everybody to, to assist in this lecture. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Professor, bye. Professor Thomas bye -bye. Yes. Professor Kirchstein, <laughs> thank you very much for being here today. I thank all participants today. Uh, at the end, I would like to um, share uh, our upcoming webinars, or I would remind about webinars uh, and masterclasses. The next masterclass is going to take place in Bern in Switzerland and uh, then in London. So you can use this opportunity to improve your skills, to improve your knowledge and make new contacts. So that's all for today. Have a nice evening and thank, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening.